formal um, block lecture is not long. Um, and it's something that we've already kind of touched on from last block. That's the 1920s. There was a, um, an AP test question, like an essay question a couple years ago, it pretty much said, uh, why, were the roaring, why were the 1920s referred to as the Roaring Twenties? So let's see if we can start with a little bit of a list of what we already know that kind of culturally define this very kind of important key decade, where a lot of things changed, uh, but kind of overseeing this change was a government that was kind of pretty conservative. Um, so 1920 rolls around. Um, the Wilson and the Democrats and the progressives are thrown out of power. They are replaced by a conservative government. Um, but culturally speaking, from last block, what made the 20s war, Elizabeth? Music. Music. Uh, jazz. Jazz. Flappers. Jazz. Flappers. Jazz. What else? Cars. Cars. Singles. Oh, radios? Radio. Movies, I heard over there. Sports. Dating without pants. That kind of head goes with flappers a little bit. Jazz, flappers, cars, smoking, radios, movies, sports. Um, we kind of spoke about that critical elite, um, the lost generation kind of making fun of ordinary Americans. You saw like the, the so monkey trial is an example of that. Did you have your hands in the pop up? Yeah. yeah. Um, That's earlier, it's 1890s. Um, <coughs> good list. Um, yeah. That like the lost generation, kind of the elites looking on Americans as not that criticism of America not not out of a position of taking what was already there and improving it, but the idea that society can only be fixed if it is completely like torn down and then built back up. Um, I wanted to specifically look at um, movies and sports and radio in one kind of, and this is something that we've lost again, like in the last 20 years, um, is, Radio and movies and sport worked together to kind of create an American mass culture. Meaning, everybody saw the same movies. And everybody sort of lives with the same radio shows. That if you turned on a television, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, there were maybe five stations, six. Which meant that pretty much, now if I ask you what you did yesterday for entertainment, the 28 of you are probably going to have at least 24 or 25 different answers. That there's the chance that Sandra, you know, consumes entertainment in the same way that James does and the same way that Debbie does is quite frankly not likely anymore. You flip on the TV and there are hundreds and hundreds of channels and that doesn't even get into you know, what's available on the internet. We have taken this mass culture that had once existed and completely fractured it again. Not only can we you know, watch different things, but we don't have to watch what's on at the time it's on. I mean, we can watch it on demand. We can watch it streaming on our phones. You know, if you walked into school in 1975, a sizable chunk, I'm not saying everybody, but a sizable chunk the night before had watched The Brady Bunch with their family. That is not how we consume entertainment any longer. And because of that, we have lost kind of that mass culture that we had for, from about the 20s through the 70s. Everybody saw the same television shows. Everybody saw the same movies. Everybody, you know, um, followed, you know, the same general sports. And that was a big part of kind of creating this, this, Amer this 20th century American culture that is no longer how we live. Um, our entertainment choices have fragmented so much due to the fact that we can pretty much watch whatever we want. 
Oh, what little pretty bunches on it? It's kind of funny. Why not? Now we kind of specify exactly what makes, what entertains me. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter if it entertains anyone else that lives in my house because I have it right on my device. But for two or three generations, there was this kind of mass American culture that everybody kind of saw the same shows and everybody kind of saw the same movies and listened to the same radio programs, watched the same television shows. Um, and that starts kind of with the technology um, in the 1920s that allows for that to happen. Um, so this is something that we've already kind of covered. I want to talk a little bit next about changes in industry. First of all, the 1920s were a boom decade. Economically, people were doing very, very well. One exception, farmers were not. But everybody else, there was a rising standard of living, rising wages, falling prices. People were, it, it was good economic times from about 1921 to 1929. Boom years. Boom. Economic boom. Economic growth. Across all classes except farmers and across, you know, all regions of the country. Is that why they're called boomer babies? No, that's the baby. A boom is an increase. If I say that, yeah, that, that a they're boom, one of the today. definitions of the, the boomers were children born after World War II, the baby boom. Why is it called the baby boom? Because, because, because there was a lot of babies. That the, birth, that the birth rate in America went up to three and a half um, children per women in the 20 years after World War II before it shrunk back down. Um, but the word boom means an increase. An economic boom is an improving economy, a good economy. Baby boom, a lot of babies. Industry shifts. The industry of the second industrial revolution Belmachi, can you please come down to the main office of Kavira? Belmachi. Industry in the Second Industrial Revolution was mostly heavy industry. There's some consumer, but most of the time, what we're talking about here, heavy industry, is stuff that's really locomotives, ships, buildings. No one has a locomotive at their house. You know, when we are building railroad tracks and factories and skyscrapers and houses and bridges and tunnels and stuff that is big and stuff that is heavy. That's why it's called a heavy industry. In the 1920s, there is still plenty of heavy industry going on. What's up? <laughs> In the 1920s, there's still plenty of heavy industry going on, but there is also a shift into what we call consumer products. Stuff that you use, Steph, I don't care if you eat, but up here, that's where the show is. What is consumer manufacturing? It's stuff that you use where? Every day, every day. Every day at home. Some revolutionary stuff. Washing machines. How many of you, how many of you have ever washed clothes by hand on a washboard? Not yet. Yeah, how many, raise your hand if you've ever washed clothes on a washboard. Wait, I want to a farm. It's hard. It's work. Not only, not only is it physically demanding, destroys your hands. Anyone ever look at any old lady hand? Kibera Balmachi, can you please come down to the main office? Please, Kibera Balmachi. Gross. Strong as hell. Yeah. That's why my grandmother could like beat like most everybody in my family at arm wrestling until she was like 70. She was like just ripped. My grandmother was like the champion arm wrestling. <laughs> Washing day, you know, because washing, washing was women's work. 
but men were off working at a paid job. But the clothes still need to be washed. As my wife says, there's no clothes washing fairy. They don't wash themselves. Someone's got to do it. That was women's work. Washing the clothes is an exhausting thing that takes an entire day. The washing machine saves so much time and labor. Anyone here ever beat a rug? It's horrible. How do you what, what is it? How do you beat a rug? Yeah, so to 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 beat a rug, you got to move your furniture. You got to roll up the rug. You got to put it on your shoulder. You got to walk it out of the house. You got to lay it on the line, and you take this little stick with a big kind of circle on the end that everybody would have had in every house, and you take this stick and you beat the ever-loving crap out of the rug, and all the dust and dirt flies off, and then you take the rug off the line, roll that up into the house, lay it down, roll it. That's Tuesday. That's work. Technology did more for women's liberation from housework than any women's liberation groups ever did. Now that washing and, and you know, that's a vacuum cleaner, oh my god, a vacuum cleaner! You know, for a very long time, people did not have vacuum cleaners. This saves so much time. Now women are able to do other things with that time that they are saving. Sewing machines. Anyone ever drive down Trumbull Street all the way to the end? That gigantic building on the left-hand side across from the Early Childhood Center? You know what that is? Or was? That was the, the, the Singer Sewing Machine Factory. About 30% of all the sewing machines in the world were made in that building. Now with an electric, ele electric lights in people's houses. By 1920, almost everybody who doesn't live out on a, even farms, m many, many farms, especially in the north, by the 1920s have telephone service. By the 1920s, almost everybody has electric lighting in their house. These are huge changes. Telephones, sewing machines, washing machines, vacuum cleaners. Um, go a long way in changing how people live. You know, it's not like, you know, Mrs. You know, Joan Smith, whose life now does not consist around washing day is Monday, rug beating day is that Her life is different now. Very different because of technology and because of the changes in American industry. Even farmers living out on isolated farms could buy this stuff through catalog sales and did. Standard of living goes up for almost everybody during the 1920s. What also happens to allow people to kind of buy this stuff is for the first time people can purchase items uh, on credit. You don't have enough money, that's okay. Put a little down payment in installments you know, over the next 12 months. People like that. This give not it doesn't give birth to it, but it certainly brings about a revolution in the advertising industry. Everybody knows what's the newest thing. Somebody said, and I'm sure they're right because people have done research on this, you as American teenagers in 2015 see something like 3,000 advertisements a day. You see advertisements, you don't even recognize you're looking at advertisements. When, when Steve looks over at Eddie, he sees an advertisement. It's right there on, at Eddie's computer. It's HP. HP, the branding is right there. You can't look around without seeing branding on things. Explicit advertising. Every time you go into a different web page, there's ads everywhere. Drive down the road, billboard. You, we see so much advertising. And people have tracked how much advertising you see in a day. And that's not even the obvious advertising, like commercials. Do you know how much companies pay to put their products in movies? How much Coke and Pepsi fight with each other for the guy in the movie to drink a Coke and not a Pepsi? Lots of money. It's called product placement. You can get a job. Here comes Kevin, going to run into the room. 
Oh, yeah. Love you. Love you, Love you too. <laughs> You'll need to see other people. <laughs> there are people whose job it is to do product placement. That they talk to television shows and movies and say, what, you know, how much are we going to pay for the actors in this television show to use, you know, Nike? Or, you know, Microsoft and not Apple, or Apple and not, these are millions and millions of dollars every year. Billions, probably. All of this stuff kind of combines to create this consumerist culture, which we still live in very much so today. We judge each other very largely by what sort of stuff we have. You get a sense of keeping up with the Joneses. What does that mean? What's that phrase? It's kind of a, it's a, it's a phrase. Keeping up with the Joneses. Somebody told me in third year today that this was in a Fairly Odd Parents episode. Keeping up with the Joneses. Keeping up with the Joneses. Not quite a trend. You not what not what everyone else does, but you want what somebody else has. And then you're sitting there in your neighborhood. And you look over, and you know, Mr. Jones has a new car. And you want one. You look, you're sitting there talking to your friend. Guys, this is very alive and well. When somebody walks in with a new phone, everyone's like, I want it. I want it. The iPhone 4. Obviously, this antiquated, obsolete, obsolete, no longer useful piece of technology. Now I want the five. One day the five is going to be no good. I want the six. I'm not going to want the seven. There's nothing wrong with the five. There's nothing wrong with the one, probably. There is this sense. Now, in one regard, in one regard, this is what drives an economy. Businesses want to sell you new crap all the time. You know, the more crap you buy, the more people have jobs. The more people have jobs, the more money they have to buy other pieces of crap. This is why there's no they ever see that show hoarders. There's people that can't throw anything away. Their houses are full to the ceiling with crap. Someone should stick to houses. How much? I was reading this. You know, even about. In the 1880s, 18, kitchens were built with no cabinets. Because people didn't have enough stuff to put in cabinets. Middle class people, not poor people. Middle class people, they just didn't have enough stuff that you need cabinets for. Now, you drive around, how many self-storage places do you see? Why? Because we have too much shit, we can't fit in our house. We need another house. <laughs> We have bought into, there is stuff you care so little about that is not even in your house, but you still want it. Very strange. We have bought into this consumerist culture where in a lot of ways we are defined by the clothes we wear, the car we drive, the phone that's in our pocket that said, that starts back here with this rise in consumer products. As we've said before, we are incredibly wealthy. We are wealthy beyond the dreams of most of humanity for all of time. You live a materially much more comfortable life than any king in medieval Europe ever dreamed of living. Politics, now all these changes All these changes are being overseen by a very conservative Republican government. Now, this is an important point that we're going to see repeated. 
Election 1920, Wilson's gone, the progressives are gone, most of the Democrats are gone. They are replaced by a conservative Republican from Ohio by the name of Warren G. Harding, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, from Vermont. They get rid of some of the most egregious examples of war socialism. The hugely high taxes are out. Government wage and price controls are out. Those things that we kind of listed on the board earlier in the week, the Sedition Act, no longer enforced. A lot of that stuff is out. But, and here's the really important caveat, all of the other progressive stuff that had gone on that we looked at last block stays. The antitrust laws stay. 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th Amendments stay. Um, the working hours and conditions, all those laws stay. The antitrust acts, like I said, stay. That as conservative as Harding and Coolidge might have been, there was no chance that they would undo what the progressives had done in the previous 20 years. They get rid of some of the more egregious stuff. But all that other stuff stays. Um, they're as close to laissez-faire as American politics are ever going to see again. Um, especially Coolidge. Um, Coolidge is famous for his tax cutting, budget cutting, he cut. He wanted to cut the budget so badly. He made you know the White House secretary cut back on the paper and the pencils, you know that they used, and gave her you know a big congratulations when she reduced the cost of running the White House. Um, yeah. Hoover also a Republican, but not nearly as conservative as Harding and Coolidge. Are. There's a famous story about Coolidge. Coolidge was very famously, his nickname was Silent Cow. What's up? Oh. Excuse Let's, me, can we get a cardboard from the trailer? Uh, you, you need a cat, only the captains have keys. Oh, because Alejandro asked me if I could go. So Ashley would have one? Yeah. Okay, thank you. What do you need? There's plenty cardboard. of cardboard in there. Oh, okay. Take some of the cardboard in there. Only the captains have keys to the trailer. Okay, thank you. Um, There's a thing, so Calvin Coolidge was the opposite of what we kind of consider to be a modern president. He um, was very famously quiet um, at a party one time, uh, this kind of very, you know, society, well-bred woman kind of said, you know, Mr. Coolidge, I have a bet that I can make you say more than two words. Coolidge looked at her and said, you lose. <laughs> So that's kind of what's going on politically. That you have all of these, this economic, these are, um, Coolidge said, you know, the business of America is business. And let businesses get on with producing all of the, you know, stuff that they were producing in the 1920s. Internationally, I know I'm going, I want to talk about communists. Foreign policy, we have a policy, this is kind of a complicated uh, word, but it's an easy concept. It's called multilateral disarmament. Which means something very simple. The United States gets together with a couple other countries, France, England, Japan, Italy, whatever, and they have a treaty that says we're going to have fewer battleships. And that's all this is. Multi-lab, multi meaning many, multilateral, many different parties. Disarmament, getting rid of our weapons. In your notes, this is all the 553 treaties, the 4, 3, 2, 1, all those numbers. The details of them are not important. What is important is the concept that in the 1920s, after the war, we rejected the League of Nations, like we saw yesterday, and instead put our faith in treaties that we said, well, wars won't be as bad if we have fewer weapons. 
Government's cheaper when you have fewer battleships, obviously. So we reduced the number of ships we had, reduced the number of new ships that we would build, etc., etc., um, and in treaty agreements with other countries. So that's that's what's going on there. Um, Normal sea, silent cal, international affairs. Um, the Dawes plan. The Dawes plan is a plan to be. Um, so, and I, I want to do this quickly because I do want to talk about Russia. Germany. is supposed to send reparations. Remember we talked about reparations? Germany is supposed to pay for the cost of World War I. Germany is supposed to send Britain and France money. What is Britain and France going to do with that money? Give it to the United States. Because the United States lent Great Britain and France billions of dollars during the war. But the problem is what? Germany is not able to pay its debts. So Germany doesn't pay Great Britain and France, which means Great Britain, the United States says, uh, excuse us, uh, our money, please, maybe. And Great Britain and France say, no, we can't pay you back because we haven't gotten any money from Germany. And this pisses off everybody. Nobody's happy. This problem is solved with something called the Dawes Plan. It's one of those things that you look at it and you say, well, how the hell does that work? Basically, what it happens is the United States, private banks in the United States loan money to Germany, who take that money and give it to Great Britain and France, who take it and give it back to the United States, everybody's happy. That's the law. Germany will have to pay America back, that's the law, right? But they don't know that, right? What? Well, Great Britain doesn't know that. Of course they do. Oh, then. Great Britain, right, right, right. as long as the money rolls in, they don't care where it hell comes from. They just get their money. Well, all right. You want to play a funny little game? <laughs> money is strange stuff. Here's five dollar bill. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that everybody in this, so I want, find a neighbor, find someone you're sitting next to, right in order, okay? find someone. I want you to imagine for a second, I want you to imagine for a second, okay, that everybody, so let me kind of reset this up, I'm sorry. I want everyone to look at the person to their right. Okay, and we'll look at the person here, and we'll kind of snake this around. So we're going to go this way. One, two, or one, two, or, yes. One, two, three, four, to Judy, and then around this way, to um, you guys, and then from Marbella to Elizabeth, and then to Anaya, this way. Um, we'll go this way, all the way around, and then to uh, Christopher, and uh, Daniela, and Lindsay. I want you to look at that person, and I want you to imagine that you owe that person $5. Alright? I want you to imagine. You owe me five bucks. I want you to imagine that you owe that person five dollars. And your goal, your goal is to pay off that debt. Did you just pay Eddie? Steve, hang on. Steve, did you just pay Eddie for five bucks that you owed him? Just pay him five bucks now, Eddie. She owes me. Which I get to owe. Is the debt satisfied now? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Oh, no. You know that's wrong, Sandra. <laughs> Judy owes Steph five bucks. Steph owes Jonathan five bucks. Jonathan owes Jean five bucks. Is everybody satisfied? You got your five bucks in your own and paid someone five bucks? So technically you owe me money. That's what she's saying. And she's going to give you the money and then you owe her. You satisfied? You're owed five bucks, you got it, and you paid off your debt? No. Can I like buy other stuff? No. Well then you're not gonna be able to pay your debt. That's okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's real, I promise. That's like saying And now you pay the original banker back. All of a sudden. Wow. Might as well just cut the thing. Isn't that weird? In simplistic form, yeah. No, so Aurelio is right. Aurelio studies, Aurelio is seeing kind of what the advantage here is. Germany has really difficult, Germany still owes money, but now it doesn't owe money to Great Britain and France, it owes money to a private, not the U.S. government, no, the private, the private, private bankers. bankers, but private bankers, private bankers look at the situation and say, you know, I don't know, <laughs> they say, it's still Germany, the Germans are rich, they, they, they have an educated workforce, they have fertile land, a ton of raw materials, if you just give them the chance, Germany will eventually get rich again, and then what will they do? They pay us back. Did they pay the uh, They did until Hitler came to power. Hitler said, all right, no more paying off the loans. So the reason, so um, American bankers are not going to make loans that are not, in their estimation, going to make them money. They loan money to Germany to get this process rolling because they assume correctly that German, Germany is not a poor country. As long, I mean, the Germans almost made communism work, and that's impossible. The, the Germans, for whatever they are, they are efficient and economical people. And so the bankers that, made, that came up with this Dawes plan counted on Germany recovering eventually, um, which they did, except it was under Hitler, and Hitler said, no more paying back loans. And that was kind of the end of that. Um, but that was the thought behind the Dawes Plan, which is a part of this 1920s foreign policy. Okay.